Would you bow and pray with me, please? Dear Lord, our Father in heaven, we come to thee now in prayer, in adoration, and in humility. Lord, we know that many times we fall short of your glory. Lord, we know many times that we sin. We pray, Lord, that you forgive us of these things. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to worship, for this life, and most importantly, for the sacrifice of your Son. Lord, please watch over this service. We pray that it may please you. Lord, please watch over the afflicted, especially in our own community. Lord, please give wisdom and strength to our civil servants, the members of our church, the members of our community, our military and police members, and our leaders in government. Lord, we pray that we do all things according to your will. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
today our topic of discussion is the Decalogue, or the more commonly known word is the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments can be found recorded in Exodus chapter 20, if you would like to open your Bibles there. There is another location where they are recorded in the Bible, one that is sometimes forgotten, and that is the retelling of the law on the plains of Moab when, when Moses retold the law there uh, to the next generation. We find the Ten Commandments repeated there in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And so in two chapters of the Bible, we find this list of ten thou shalt nots. They were originally given to Moses on Mount Sinai. They were given in two tablets of stone uh, written by the very finger of God according to Exodus chapter 31 verse 18. <clears throat> they were uh, subsequently kept in the, uh, in the Ark of the Covenant for hundreds of years. Israel kept them within the Ark of the Covenant until they were eventually lost along with the Ark and all of the uh, other uh, continents, uh, contents of the Ark. Uh, the picture that you uh, see on the title screen uh, for our lesson today uh, is, as, as far as I know, the best attempt uh, to replicate the tables or tablets of stone that Moses received. Of course, uh, they aren't the originals. The originals have been lost. No one al is alive today that has any idea exactly what they looked like, but uh, these are the uh, these are likely the most most accurate replica, uh, at cer certainly at least the most uh, most uh, uh, accurate as far as I can tell. They are uh, the only existing example, which includes all of the biblical text found in the scriptures, uh, written in the ancient Hebrew and also written on rough granite, uh, like in color as to that found on Mount Sinai. <clears throat> now I'm just old enough to remember when the Ten Commandments were posted in classrooms, in, in school classrooms on the walls and uh, you know the ruling I'm about to mention happened in 1980 and I was born in 75 and and so I must have either been very young or the school I attended must have uh, delay, had a delayed response to the court ruling but I do in fact remember seen the Ten Commandments posted on schoolroom walls. I do remember standing before uh, a poster and reading them one by one and considering them. But as I mentioned, in November, the 7th, November 17, 1980, the U.S. Supreme Court in the landmark case Stone v. Graham ruled that posting the Ten Commandments in school classrooms was unconstitutional, violating the First Amendment's uh, establishment clause, or more commonly referred to today as separation of church and state. Well, the public response to that court ruling was mixed. Some people were delighted. Others were appalled. As for me, I was too young to really have much of an opinion at the time, but I will say looking back, it certainly seemed, uh, at least to my, to my young mind, that things were uh, people were, had a lot more reverence for God uh, and for his will during that time. And, and I can't help but think that those commands that were posted on classroom walls, at least for some time, had a positive effect in the lives of young people. Uh, however, there were also some misconceptions uh, then and even now in relation to the Ten Commandments. And I certainly want to talk about those today. Now, we're going to focus uh, today as we focus on the Ten Commandments. I want to make this point right up front that there is no denying the great moral value contained within the Ten Commandments. They came from God. They are obviously good. But I do want to talk about some misconceptions and uh, that some have regarding those Ten Commandments and the biblical truths that have been uh, underemphasized that has led to these misunderstandings and so uh, <clears throat> open your go ahead and open your Bibles to one of those locations either Deuteronomy 5 or, or Exodus chapter 20 and let's see what we can learn and, and come to understand more about the Ten Commandments. Now first of all I want to talk about these uh, some of these misconceptions. 
even though the Ten Commandments are the best known law in the world, they are still probably the least understood law in all the world <clears throat> as well. The uh, first misunderstanding I want to make a point of is that, number one, few people understand that the Ten Commandments were really given to the Jews and were only meant for the Jews. I might come as a shocking statement to many people, but it is biblically accurate. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 7 through 21, where we find the Ten Commandments listen, uh, listed that second, excuse me, that second time by Moses, he prefaced that reading uh, by emphasizing this very fact. If you are open to the Deuteronomy location, read with me chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. It reads, The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. Horeb is another word for Mount Sinai. The Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us who are all of us here alive this day. And so he makes he emphasizes that this was not given to others. It wasn't given to our fathers. It was given to us. <clears throat> the co a covenant uh, is defined as an agreement between two parties, and it affects no others. Now, certainly when it comes to a covenant with God, God is the one who makes the terms to that covenant. However, a covenant only affects the parties that are involved in the covenant. And the Mosaic law, including the Ten Commandments, was a covenant between God and the Jews, no others, with the one exception being those who might convert, those Gentiles who would convert to Judaism, well, then they would, they would uh, become amenable to that law of Moses when they converted to Judaism. So what about the rest of the world? Were they then not accountable to God for anything? Well, of course they were accountable to God. They were under the same law that Israel's fathers that was mentioned uh, were under. Remember, uh, Moses said this: the covenant was not made with uh, our fathers, but with us. So what were the fathers under? The fathers were under the patriarchal law. And since this covenant was made with between God and the Jews, those outside of, of, the, of, of Israel, then we may only assume then that they were still under the, the patriarchal law. A second point that we should make in regards to the Ten Commandments is that, uh, and, and a misconception, is that few people understand that the Ten Commandments were only meant to be a temporary law. They were all, it was always meant, that as far as the entire law of Moses, was always meant to be done away with later on. It was never meant to be more than temporary. Of course, there's many implications within Scripture uh, to this end, but I want to focus especially on the one that's really clear and specific, and that is Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 31, 31 through 34, Jeremiah said, <clears throat> reading verses 31 through 34, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that, notice this, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and they shall teach them or every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Of course, uh, uh, any... Any uh, beginning Bible student or at least intermediate Bible stu student knows that that new covenant he spoke about is the gospel, the one that was brought about by the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and it extends to all people, Jew and Gentile alike. <clears throat> now, the Hebrew writer notes this when he referred, and, and in doing so, he refers back to Jeremiah's prophecy that we re just read. The text is Hebrews chapter 8, 6 through 13. Now I'm going to read that, but I'm going to leave out Jer the reading of Jeremiah that we just read for time's sake. 
but I'll indicate where it would be inserted. And so beginning at Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6, but now he, and that he is Jesus, hath obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. For if the first covenant, that is the Old Testament law of Moses, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for a second. What was the fault with it? Was the, was the law imperfect? For finding fault with them, the fault was that they couldn't keep it. For finding fault with them, he saith, and, and this is where the insertion of, the, the where he quotes, the Hebrew writer quotes Jeremiah, and we'll pick up back at verse number 13 after he concludes that. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. And so according to the Hebrew writer that a new covenant was established this by Jesus and a better covenant, and this is exactly that which Jeremiah prophesied about, and that first covenant is now old and it is decayed. The New American Standard Bible translate that, op, translates that word decay as obsolete. The Old Testament is now obsolete and waxes old. It's ready to vanish away. And so... Uh, so yes, many, few people understand that that, that old Mosaic law was never meant to be permanent, but it was in fact temporary. <clears throat> the Jews didn't understand that, and uh, that's what was a great stumbling block for them, and many people today in the religious world still do not understand this biblical principle. But number three, a, a third misconception is that few people understand that the Ten Commandments have been invalidated. They no longer apply to us as a law. Colossians chapter 2 verse 14, Paul said, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Now let's stop there for a minute. What handwriting of ordinances are we talking about? We're talking about the, the Old Testament. We're talking about the Mosaic law, including the Ten Commandments. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So what happened to the old law when Jesus brought the new law? He nailed that old one to the cross. He took it out of the way. It's no longer against us. It's no longer, it's no lo we're no longer amenable to that law. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 15, Paul also wrote, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, to make for in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And so as we these are just a sampling of there's other verses that we could we could use, but these suffice to show the Ten Commandments are no longer applicable to us today. We are no longer bound by that law. We are bound by the New Testament law. Finally, one fourth point, one fourth misconception. Few people understand today that we must keep certain commands, but not because they're one of the Ten Commandments, but because they are in the New Testament. You know, upon hearing that we're no longer bound to the Ten Commandments today, many times people will immediately ask, so, so are you trying to say that murder, adultery, uh, covetousness, and those things listed there as thou shalt not, you mean to tell me that those are no longer sinful? Well, the answer is no, absolutely. They, they are still sinful. We're not saying that they are no longer sinful. In fact, they were sinful before the Mosaic law came about. They were sinful when Cain killed Abel, murder was sinful. Uh, murder was sinful under the patriarchal law. Murder was sinful under the Mosaic law. And murder is sinful under the law of Christ. But when we when we commit such a thing, it's not that we are in violation of the Mosaic law that matters. It's that we have been that we have violated the law of Christ. You see, certain laws are moral laws, and they are they are they are wrong in any dispensation. They have all, they will always be wrong and have always been wrong. And so, what these certain things are not wrong because they were one of the Ten Commandments. They're wrong because they're morally wrong and because they're part of the law of Christ. 
and nine of the original Ten Commandments have been brought over into the new. Or we might say uh, they have been uh, reestablished, uh, reiterated, uh, brought over into the new law where Jesus not only taught them, but he even expanded on a lot of those teachings. And so we want to spend some of our time now looking at each one of the Ten Commandments and notice, uh, notice the New Testament principles where they have been brought over into the New Testament. And so with this part of the lesson then, let's notice the, new, the Ten Commandments today. Now first, before we do so, I think it's good to note uh, that the Ten Commandments easily divide into two sections. Uh, the first four of the Ten Commandments deal with man and his relationship to God. And the last six of the Ten Commandments have to do with one's relationship with his fellow man. You might recall that how Jesus stated on one occasion that on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets, that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And the second is likened to it, thou shalt love the neighbor, thy neighbor as thyself. Matthew chapter 22 verse 37 and 39. And so we could think about the Ten Commandments this way. The first four is to deal with man's relationship to God. They help us understand how to love the Lord thy God with all our heart, with all thy soul, and with all our mind. Whereas the last six help us to understand how to uh, have a good relationship with our fellow man, how to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And so with these things in mind, let's look at the first four of the Ten Commandments uh, that have to do with man's relationship to God. Commandment number one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now so I will say here that some of these commandments, the reading, I'm just putting the, the uh, abbreviated uh, it's command uh, in, uh, I will just quote the, uh, the main part of the command but if you follow along in the reading, you will see that there are some other uh, specifics that are listed within that as well. Those aren't necessarily important for our, for our purpose right now. But commandment number one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Uh, <clears throat> first thing to note in relation to, the, to this within the New Testament is that you may remember when Jesus, after he was baptized, he went into the wilderness where he was tempted and the devil tempted him and the devil tried to get him to bow down and worship him. But you remember in Matthew chapter 4, verse 10, Jesus said to him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and, in, and him only shall thou serve. And so we see that principle played out in Jesus' life, exemplified there. Uh, and a person might say, Well, Jesus lived under the old law, which is true. And at this point, this isn't Jesus necessarily teaching the new law to his disciples. And so I'm not so sure that this is an example of the commandment being brought over in the New Testament. Uh, well, fair enough. It's not the only one we've got. But I will say in regard to that, that, that the Bible tells us that in the Ten Commandments, we read that God said that he is a jealous God. And we understand that the nature of God doesn't change from Whatever dispensation we're in, the nature of God doesn't change. And so therefore, if God was a jealous God and it bothered these things bothered him then, they certainly bother him now. But a New Testament principle that's very plain is 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3, which reads, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatry. You see, the worship of other gods was wrong in the Mosaic dispensation, and according to uh, Peter here, it, idolatry is still abominable, and abominable means unlawful. It was unlawful then. It's still unlawful today, even under Christ's law. And so, uh, we see then that this principle is not only Old Testament, but it's brought over into the new as well. Commandment number two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. That's Exodus 24 through 6 or Deuteronomy 5, 8 through 10. <clears throat> In addition to uh, 1 Peter 4, 3 that we just read about 
that shows uh, idolatries to be abominable, that point is just as valid in relation to commandment number two as it was to commandment number one. But in addition to that, there's 1 John 5.21. And John said, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. And so again, we see it's brought over into the new. Paul writing to the Galatians chapter 5, 19 and 20. Paul lists the works of the flesh. He says, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And he gives a list. And then appearing there in verse number 20 on the list is idolatry. Idolatry. It was wrong then and it is wrong now. Moving on to commandment number three. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Exodus 20 verse 7, Deuteronomy 5 11. In Matthew chapter 6 verse 9, Jesus said, After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. From this we're reminded that God's name is, is to be hallowed, or another word for that is holy. Holy things are treated differently than common things. Holy things, sacred things, are in contrast to that which is common and that which is profane. And this statement here, hallowed be thy name, just reminds us of really the basis on which commandment three was given in the first place. Why should men not take the name of the Lord God in vain? Because God is holy, God is sacred, and God was trying to, to teach his people how to treat that which is holy. And, there, and of course, one of the ways that, that the Jews would often use, take the name of the Lord in vain, and one that's still used even today, is by, is by swearing or making oaths upon his name. In the Jews' desire to avoid swearing to God, it had become in the first century a common practice among the Jews to swear on earthly things rather than God. And so they might swear on they might swear on the temple or they might swear on, on heaven or 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 the king or or something, but they would try to avoid uh, swearing on God. And they had this elab they had even devised this elaborate a uh, list of things that were acceptable to swear on and things that were not acceptable to swear on. <clears throat> and uh, that's one of the ways God's name was taken in vain by invoking his name on petty oaths and promises. People still do it today that when they say things like, well, I swear to God, I will do it. And uh, But what did Jesus say in regard to this in the New Testament? Matthew chapter 5, 33 through 37, Jesus' well-known Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, Again, you have heard it hath been said by them of old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself. That word forswear means to, uh, to uh, swear an oath falsely, to break your oath. In other words, you've heard it said of old time, don't break an oath that you make to God. But thou shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, neither shall by, thou swear by the, thy head, because thou cannot make one hair white or black, but let your communication be yea, nay, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more, of this, more than this cometh evil. And so Jesus, in typical fashion, gets straight down to the heart of the matter. Yes, it was wrong to to uh, use the name of the Lord's use the Lord's name in vain, and that was one of the problems with swearing. But there was something else that Jesus gets down to, and that is, you know, we should be people of our word. We shouldn't have to make we shouldn't have to swear and promise and make oaths to our word. Ought to be our bond anyway. And so again, we see this carried over into the new law. Let's look now at commandment number four. Commandment number four, Exodus twenty. Uh, the reading covers verses 8 through, through 11 and also Deuteronomy 5, 12 through 15. The commandment in short is, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Sabbath day means the seventh, it, is the seventh, it corresponds to the seventh day of the week or our Saturday. Now the word Sabbath, it means rest. 
The Hebrew word actually means to cease or to abstain. Thus the Jews were instructed to do absolutely no work on that day. This, now this is the one of the Ten Commandments that is not brought over into the new. It is not brought over. It is not reiterated, reaffirmed as part of the gospel system. Rather, uh, in the New Testament, we find no instructions whatsoever for keeping the Sabbath. Uh, we see no, we see no example, no implication, no command at all to observe the Sabbath. In the New Testament, instead, we are commanded to keep not the seventh day of the week, but the first day of the week. And there's great significance to the first day of the week in the Christian system. First of all, Jesus was resurrected on the first day of the week, Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. Second, the church began on the first day of the week, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. The disciples met on the first day of the week to partake of the Lord's Supper, Acts chapter 20, verse 7. The disciples gave of their means on the first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. And so, in the new, under Christ, under his law, there's another day of the week that is important to the Christian. Now, some have, have come to the conclusion, they have supposed then that the Lord's Day is, is the, quote, Christian Sabbath, end quote. But folks, let me, let me emphasize that that is not the case. True, there are similarities between the Jews' observance of the Sabbath day and the Christians' observance of the Lord's day. But there are also many con contrasts in addition to those similarities. The New Testament never suggests that the Lord's Day is the Christian Sabbath, and neither should we. We should hold fast to the form of sound words, as Paul told Timothy. We should speak as of the oracles of God, as Peter said. And we should keep in mind, as Paul told Timothy, that the church is the foundation of the truth in this world. And so, therefore, let us not make analogies, and let us not make uh, make uh, comparisons between things that the Bible has not authorized. Let's not call it the Christian Sabbath if we don't have any authority to call it such. That is a good way to bring about false doctrines. And in fact, there are those uh, who teach that Augustine changed uh, in 300 and something AD, changed the Christian Sabbath from the, from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week. Well, there's a lot of misunderstanding there. First of all, uh, the Christians, <clears throat> excuse me, Christians were observing the first day of the week long before Augustine came about, and that was put in place by by the apostles, not by Augustine. Second of all, it's not the Christian Sabbath. The Bible doesn't tell us that. We should not be saying that. And so here we have that we end the first the first four of the commandments, those that have to do with man's relationship with God. Three of those have been carried over into the new. The this last one regarding the Sabbath was not carried over because God, it was, it was a law that pertained to that covenant alone. And under the new covenant, we have a different law in place in regard to the first day of the week. And so now let's look at the last six of the Ten Commandments, which focus on man's relationship with his fellow man. Commandment number five, honor thy father and thy mother. Exodus 20 verse 12, also Deuteronomy 5 16. Honor thy father and thy mother. When Jesus was asked by the rich young ruler what good thing he should do to inherit life, Jesus reply, replied <clears throat> first with a list of, six, of the six commands toward one's fellow man. Those six, these six commandments that we are about to look at, when that young ruler asked Jesus what good thing he should do, Jesus emphasized these last six. And so this, this uh, passage, Matthew 19, 18, and 19, we actually could use it, and I have it appearing on the list, for each one of the six commands that we're about to look at. 
And so I may not mention it with each one of them, but Matthew 19, 18, and 19 is a new, is, shows all six of the following uh, commandments have been brought over into the new. That verse alone would, would suffice, but we're going to look at more. So we could add this to each one of our remaining points, but <clears throat> in which he, uh, Jesus uh, says verbatim, honor thy father and mother, Matthew 19, 19. Paul, writing to the Ephesians, also said, <clears throat> Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. Ephesians 6, 1 through 3. So again, this one is also carried over into the New Testament. Commandment number 6, Thou shalt not kill. And uh, many times people have a misunderstanding about, about this. The actual word translated kill there is really equivalent to our English word murder. It doesn't mean uh, killing in every sense is bad. Self it, it certainly doesn't mean that it's sinful to, uh, for, to, uh, to uh, kill someone in self-defense. It doesn't mean it's sinful to kill someone as a punishment by capital punishment. Uh, as the Bible defends capital punishment, and <clears throat> it doesn't mean that it's against the law that it's against the law of God to kill someone in an act of war. We have examples of all these things seen favorably by God in different situations. But the intent there is, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not. You shouldn't ki kill an innocent uh, an innocent person. Thou shalt not murder. In addition to Matthew 19, 18, which you mentioned before, applies to all of our remaining points, there's also Romans 13, 9. Romans 13, 9, Paul said, For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And so Romans 13, 9 is a good example of this command being brought over into the new. And as with Matthew 19, 18, and 19, this one applies to all the, to, the, to, to, the, to the last five of the Ten Commandments. And so this one will be repeated in further lists as well. Jesus took this teaching even further in his Sermon on the Mount when he said, You have heard that it has been said of them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And, who, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Matthew 5, 21 and 22. John, undoubtedly remembering the teaching of the Lord, said, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. 1 John 3.15. Now on to commandment number seven. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Exodus 20 verse 14. Deuteronomy 5.18. In the aforementioned lists found in Matthew, uh, in addition to those aforementioned lists, Matthew 19, 18 and 19, Romans 13, 9. In addition to those, Jesus expanded his teaching on his Sermon on the Mount when he said, Matthew 5, 27 and 28. Ye have heard it hath been said of them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery in with her already in his heart. Jesus again getting to the heart of the matter. Sin begins in the heart. And so God so the Lord is is instructing his disciples to uh, to pay attention to the heart. Uh, and take care of the heart issues, and then these other the uh, the other issues will follow. He expanded the teaching even further when he said in Matthew nineteen nine, and I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. And then Matthew, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, 
nor adulterers, nor effeminate, or abusers of themselves with mankind, neither thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, or extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Finally, one final verse, Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Easy to see, this one has clearly been brought over into the New Testament. Commandment number eight, thou shall not steal. Thou shall not steal. Again, we could add to this one the list found in Matthew 19, Romans 13, and 1 Corinthians 6 even. But we can also add to it Ephesians 4.28, where Paul wrote, let him that, steal, that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good, and that he may have to give to him that needeth. Commandment number nine, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. <clears throat> In addition to the ones we've been, that's applied to numerous commandments, is Matthew 15, 19 through 20. For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashing hands defileth not a man. Luke 3, 14. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, What shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. And then there's 1 Peter 3.10. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips that they speak no guile. And another one I don't have in my notes, but I just recall it. I just now recalled it. Revelation chapter 20, I believe. Uh, Re excuse me, Revelation 22, I believe the verses are uh, 19 and 20. Uh, where we uh, find a list of those things uh, that people will not enter into heaven by doing, and, among, and on that list is all liars, all liars. Well, that's what false witnessing is. It is lying. Commandment number 10, thou shall not covet. Thou shall not covet. Exodus 20, 17, Deuteronomy 5, 21. Those that we've, all, that of course, there's a couple of those now. The list has been ever growing of those that apply to every one of these. But in addition to those, Luke's, Luke 12, 15, and he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And then Colossians 3, 5, Paul wrote, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, or evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And so there you have it, friends, the Ten Commandments today. And so no, there's not a, there's not, we won't find these commandments listed together uh, as bullet point, like bullet points or, uh, as we did in the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament, but they certainly are there, at least nine of them. It may seem like, this may seem like a real small thing to you to point this out, but the lack of understanding in this area indicates a greater area of misunderstanding, and that is so many people in the religious world today do not understand the difference between the covenants. So many people do not understand why we don't offer animal sacrifices and incense in worship today, why we don't praise God on the harp and the flute and, and the trumpet and all these things as they did in Old Testament then. Why then? Why do we do things different under the, uh, today than we did then? Uh, and that is because the old law has been done away with and we are under a new law. Uh, Paul writing to Timothy said, 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You see, it is important for us to understand this so that we can rightly divide the word of truth. And one of the major divisions within the Bible is that between the Old and the New Testament. 
uh, in our Bibles. And that, that, that blank page in our Bibles between those testaments might be one of the most misunderstood pages in all the Bible. And so let us remember, the Ten Commandments have been taken out of the way. They have been nailed to the cross. We are no longer bound to the Ten Commandments today that appear in Exodus 20, 2 through 17, or Deuteronomy 5, 7 through 21. Now, as I mentioned, these are certainly uh, good moral principles. They came from God, and as, as many of them are based on moral principles, that is 9 of 10, have been brought over, uh, repeated in the New Testament of Christ. The one exception being that, that uh, one that wasn't a moral law, but it was a ritual law based upon Sab uh, Sabbath day observance. <clears throat> The nine commandments that have been repeated in the New Testament actually constitute a very small part of all the teachings of Christ. And in, real, in reality, that was the truth under the Old Testament as well. Uh, some people have the idea that, that under the old law, all they had to do was keep the Ten Commandments. That's, that's not true. There were 600 and I've heard some say 613, some say 618. I have not counted them, but... but uh, <clears throat> there was a great number of commandments, ordinances, and statutes that Jews had to keep in those days. And if they fell short on any of those, they were guilty and convicted of sin under the law. That's why they couldn't keep the law perfectly, and that's why a, the new law is better. It's a better law based on better promises. But the commandments that we just saw, the nine that have been brought over into the new law, and as important and good as those laws are, they still constitute a small part of the teachings of Christ. If we love the Lord, we will seek to do all of his commandments. John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments, he said. And so I hope that this has been a helpful lesson to you. I hope that you understand the difference between the covenants. Be glad to give you more information if you need or require more, if you would just ask it by means of our our comment section below or or send it reach out to us by means of the telephone number email address listed on the final screen of this production that also goes as well it, it, that uh, those uh, those numbers and contact information is also important if you would like to reach out to us to become a child of God if you have never obeyed the gospel of Christ to do so after hearing the gospel proclaimed understanding uh, sin the effects of sin in our life that the wage of sin is death. We're all guilty of death, but God has provided a substitute for us in Christ. And we can have our sins washed away only in and through Christ. How do we get into Christ? We must repent of our sins and we must be baptized to have our sins washed away. If you have any more questions or need, uh, have any more concerns related to that, please reach out to us and we will do anything and everything that we can do to help. Now let's continue on in our worship. It's now time for us to partake of the Lord's Supper. Our reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 1. And of course, this is after Jesus has already been crucified. It, the scripture says, Now after the Sabbath, now after the Sabbath, 
as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and, began, and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come see the place, uh, come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. When I think about the Lord's Supper and I contemplate his death on the cross, sometimes I like to think about the fact that he is risen. It gives us hope in that scene of uh, such horror where Jesus is crucified and the torture he went through and the reason that he went through it. But ultimately, part of the story is that he is risen, that he has overcome death. He wasn't left in the grave. The sins that he took upon us didn't end with him in the grave. He overcame death. He rose from the grave the third day, the first day of the week. And it is glorious to say, as the scripture does, he is risen. So I think that's part of what we'd like to think about uh, as we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning is that uh, Jesus is risen. Let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the fruit of the vine and the bread and this Lord's Supper as you prepared for us uh, to remember back and what Jesus did on the cross for us and that also that he, was, that he rose from the grave the third day. And Father, we're thankful for uh, a living Savior that we can point to and think about. But we do think about the bread, which represents his body, and it was given for us. It was also the same body that rose from the grave. And we're thankful uh, for all this. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's also pray for the fruit of the vine. Our loving Heavenly Father, we're thankful for Jesus and his sacrifice for us, the fact that he shed blood, he died, but then did raise from the grave the third day. But we are reminded that it was important uh, for your scriptures to be fulfilled, that he would actually die on the cross, that his blood would be shed and then would be uh, shed for us, and that that uh, blood would be the cleansing agent uh, as it were, to take away our sins. And Father, we're thankful for all this uh, that brings to our remembrance as we partake of the fruit of the vine. And we're thankful in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's also have another part of our worship, which is giving back to the Lord. Let's thank him for our blessings. Father, we're thankful uh, as we remember uh, this hour of Jesus' sacrifice and we spend time in your word. And we know from spending time in your word that you uh, um, always bless uh, those that are generous, those that love you, those that are committed to 
serving you and being faithful to you. And that is our desire. And Father, we pray that uh, you will use this gift as a, just a, a humble sign of our uh, love for you and our love for the church. And we pray that you'll bless us in this giving. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Just a few more days to be filled with praise and to tell the old story. Then in the twilight falls and my Savior falls, I shall go to him in glory. How the saints my cross are shining brown, when the gates swing out the never. At his feet I'll lay every word. Would you pray with me, please? Our most righteous and loving Heavenly Father, as we come to a close of this worship service to Thee, we pray, Father, that our worship has been pleasing and acceptable, that we've been able to worship Thee in spirit and in truth. We pray, Father, that the message that Brother Hatcher has brought to us has been one that would prick our hearts to do better service to Thee, to be the Christian example You would have us to be. We pray, Father, that we will take the message as we have heard and apply it to our everyday walks of life. We ask Thee, Father, to be with those who have been mentioned, who are sick and afflicted, especially those of the household of faith. Please be with the doctors and nurses that are working with them so that they may retain that measure of health necessary to continue with life. We ask Thee, Father, to be with all those who are dealing with the various virus issues that are going on. We pray, if it be possible, that they recover uh, to return to their normal activities. We ask Thee, Father, to be with us as we are about to depart from this place to our respective places of abode. In our everyday walks of life, we ask Thee that to forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings, for we all fall short of the glory from our daily walks of life. Please, Father, guide and guard and direct us through Thy Word, and at the end of time, may we have a home in heaven with Thee and the saints above. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.